Tejanos and the Texas Revolution. Okay? And Tejanos, um, they're in the teaks. And for those of us who study Texas history, we recognize that Tejanos are very important. But they, they never seem to get center stage in most of the conversations that we have about the teaks uh, or about Texas history in fourth and seventh grade. That's, a, that's an oversight that I think we need to really think hard about trying to correct. Because Tejanos were at the very center, as we're going to talk about today, of the Texas Revolution, the struggles that led to all of that. And their perspectives, I think, give us, you know, in many ways, a more useful insight into what was pushing the revolution than even Stephen F. Austin and some of the Anglos that tend to get more attention historically um, when we talk about these issues. So one of the things we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about Juan Seguin over here on the right. We're going to talk about Jose Antonio Navarro here on the left and try to contextualize these guys and give you guys some stories about them that hopefully you can take directly into your classrooms. Um, but to start, what I want to do is I want to give you guys a sense of how Seguin and Navarro and all the Tejanos who lived in Texas thought about um, the revolution when it began in 1835 and 1836. And this is going to build on stuff we talked about yesterday, all right? Going to talk, build on ideas of federalism and why the Constitution of 1824 was really, really important, right? And just so you guys know, this is this is going to if you're going to have your students understand Tejano perspectives on the eve of the revolution, you really have to connect things and have them see the connections between these different eras in Texas history. You got to go all the way back to the Spanish colonial period to really have understand how Tejano saw things. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell a little story of leading up to the Texas Revolution from the perspective of Tejanos in the region so that we can all understand um, where they were coming from when the, when the war broke out in 1835 and 1836, right? Obviously here's Texas. And when the Spanish arrived, um, you know, exploring Texas, uh, they, they didn't find gold as we all know, they didn't find silver. What they found were a lot of native groups that lived in Texas. And so when Spain decided to established itself permanently in Texas in 1690. And of course that doesn't work out and they have to try it again in 1716. But the way they decide to do that is through the mission system, right? They send in some Franciscan friars and they set up some missions, handful of soldiers to protect the friars occasionally. But Mexico City was doing all of this as inexpensively as they possibly could. And the mission system was the way that they thought they could get a real footprint in Texas by transforming the Indians of Texas into good Spaniards, essentially, right? And so that's what the mission system was during the Spanish colonial period, right? Here's a you know beautiful San Jose mission south of San Antonio. Um, I think one of the my favorite uh, examples of what the missions really looked like during this period. And what I always tell my students is they they focus on these missions as as places that were trying to Christianize policize the Indians, which is true, but the missions had a bigger purpose. They were really, they were meant to try to turn the Indians into Spaniards. That was the main goal with, uh, with these, these missions. And it didn't work, right? And that's something that's really important to explain to our students. Right? They didn't work because the Indians didn't want to become Spaniards. They had no interest whatsoever in going into these missions for the most part. Um, that's why this figure here in the left, you see this Franciscan here, he's been stabbed several times. This is from the San Saba mission. Um, it, 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 the missions don't work out, all right? The reason that's important, I know you guys cover that when you talk about the Spanish colonial period, but we need to connect it up through the, the decades that follow because the Spanish fail in Texas. I can't overemphasize that, right? The Spanish fail in Texas, and that makes life for the Tejanos in Texas very difficult because there's very few people in San Antonio. There's very few people in La Bahia, which will later become Goliad, and there's very few people in Nacogdoches, right? This is an area really controlled by the Indians of Texas, not really by the Spaniards, right? So by the time you get to the early 1800s, you know, the Spaniards have those three sites, San Antonio, La Bahia, Nacogdoches, and that's kind of it, right? They're basically surrounded. There's about 4,000 Tejanos in the territory. And then things get a lot worse for the Tejanos who uh, live in, in the area, all right? During the 18 teens, you have a Mexican War for Independence, all right? You have, so this is um, Miguel Hidalgo right here, this is the figure you see down here. 
He's the guy who starts the Mexican War for Independence on September 16th, 1810, with his Grito de Dolores, where he basically says we need better governance and the Spanish aren't doing a very good job, right? This matters for Texas because it leads to a lot of violence in Texas. Um, in 1810, there is a, a little rebellion in San Antonio, um, the Juan Batista de las Casas rebellion, if you guys know about that. Uh, where a Spanish military officer takes over San Antonio, you know, for like 10 minutes. It doesn't last very long. But violence, you know, comes into San Antonio pretty fast and furious. More important, and I know you guys know about this because it's very much in the teaks and it's something that I know you guys you guys touch on, the Gutierrez McGee expedition is a result of the Mexican War for Independence, right? The Gutierrez McGee expedition that comes into Texas in August of 1812 Right, they're co it, it's coming in from Louisiana, led by uh, Gutierrez and Augustus McGee, and they come in and they take over San Antonio in, in 1812, 1813. And the reason this matters is because Texas has been taken over by the rebels during the Mexican War for Independence, and they execute the governor of San Antonio, uh, a guy named Manuel Salcedo. They kill him by slitting his throat and then stabbing him to death. And when news of all that gets to Mexico City, the viceroy in Mexico City decides this is not okay. And he's going to send uh, an army to put down the rebellion. So he sends a guy whose name you see right here, Jose Joaquin de Arredondo, who when I tell the story to my students, I like to call him the butcher because that was his nickname. So you can get a sense of just how, uh, how uh, harsh this guy was by reputation, right? But Arredondo, he comes in and reasserts royal authority in Texas. He marches an army in, he fights the rebels at what's called the Battle of Medina, which is also in the Teaks, right? In August, August 18th, 1813. It's the bloodiest battle ever in Texas history. And the reason this matters in our story we're telling here is because Arredondo, he, he kills all the guys at Battle of Medina, and then he kills a lot of Tejanos in taking revenge after that. And so he marches through San Antonio, kills a lot of Tejanos, and then he runs a whole lot of other Tejanos out of Texas. They, the people from San Antonio escape and start going east along the Camino Real right here over to Nacogdoches and eventually into Louisiana itself to escape Arredondo's wrath, all right? The reason that matters is because that weakens the situation for Tejanos in Texas dramatically, all right? Then on top of that, the Comanches and Apaches start raiding San Antonio and La Bahia in even bigger numbers. All right. After the Gutierrez McGee expedition and Arredondo reclaims the territory, then the Comanches and the Apaches realize that the Tejanos who live in San Antonio and La Bahia are going to be easy pickings for raids of various sorts. All right. So in the mid 1810s, like 1815 to 1820, the, the, the Comanches and Apaches start raiding in massive numbers and they're attacking San Antonio and they're doing it pretty much every week. They're just riding through, terrorizing the, the Tejanos who survived all of this, tearing things to pieces. They go down and raid in La Bahia as well, tear things to shreds. It's just a real horrific situation for most of the Tejanos, right? So I say all of that to give you guys a sense that by the late 18 teens, all right, right on the eve of when Mexico becomes independence, it becomes independent, the Tejanos in Texas have just been through the ringer, right? It has been awful. And if you lay that groundwork, when you talk about the Spanish colonial period, what comes next will make a lot of sense to your students, right? But here's the problems that Tejanos faced by the late 18 teens. The Spanish had failed, utterly failed to populate the region with enough folks to control Texas. That leaves the Tejanos very, very vulnerable throughout this entire period, right? The Tejanos had, in addition to that, been decimated by the violence that had come with the Mexican War for Independence, right? They've been absolutely decimated by uh, the Gutierrez-McGee expedition, Arredondo's counter raid, and all the violence that had gone on with that. Then after that, they're overrun by the Indians in Texas, just absolutely pummeled into the ground by Comanches and Apaches, all right? And all of this adds up to 
them being frustrated, deeply, powerfully frustrated. And throughout all of it, they're getting kind of no support from Mexico City. It just, they ask for help, they don't get it. They ask for soldiers, they don't get it. They don't get any support from Mexico City. And I, I highlighted, I, I bolded, I guess, this one. So I wanted to flag you guys on this one to remember that. This is the seed of the Tejanos not trusting Mexico City long-term and not thinking they're gonna get long-term support from Mexico City. They have not experienced any long-term support throughout their entire experience, all right? And so by 1820, the Tejanos who lived in San Antonio, which included Navarro here and Seguin, amongst many others, is that by 1820, the Tejanos are on the edge of just abandoning the territory. How do we know this? Because they said it. <laughs> the Tejanos said in letters to Mexico City at this time, yeah, we're done. We're just going to, we can't live here, right? The, the, we're being killed. We're being raided. There's no support. It's We're so impoverished. It's not even funny. So we're kind of done. We're going to abandon the territory. The governor at the time, a guy named Antonio Martinez, he wrote letters to the viceroy in Mexico City, essentially saying, yeah, they're going to abandon this place. And I, I don't really blame them because it's kind of awful, right? We need to know that context. Text. Your students need to know that context because that's the moment when Moses Austin rides into Texas and he arrives in San Antonio, uh, December 23rd, 1820. Right? Now, when I took seventh grade Texas history, which was a very long time ago, we were using film strips at the time. Okay, so that dates me, if nothing else. But when I took Texas history, you know, we kind of just started with Moses Austin. Like Moses had an idea and he rode into Texas. Well, great. And he has an interesting idea we'll talk about in a second. But what you have to remember is what the Tejanos have been through by the time Moses Austin arrives, because it's up to the Tejanos to decide if they're going to agree to Moses Austin's idea here. Right? Moses has a proposal. The Tejanos are the ones who have to decide if they think it's a good idea. And you have to understand what the Tejanos have been through up until this point to understand why they think Moses Austin's idea is at least worth trying, all right? So Moses has his idea and he proposes his thing. And then, you know, his son Austin takes over the enterprise and he's the guy we'll talk about mostly. But what are the Austins proposing to the Tejanos? They're proposing to bring in American farmers, right? And we talked a little bit about this yesterday. We'll talk more about it today. But what they're proposing is to bring in an American farm like this, 300 of these kinds of farms. All right, they'll come in from the United States and they'll bring in farmers and the Americans will want to come in because, you know, getting land in the United States had gotten much harder and gotten more expensive, uh, particularly after the panic of 1819. It got really hard to buy land in the United States. So there's a lot of American farmers who want land for reasons we'll talk more about in a little bit. Um, and then the, that's what the Austins are proposing to bring all these guys in. How does that sound? to the Tejanos, like Jose Antonio Navarro here. What do you guys think? Sounds fantastic, right? Or as I always tell my students, it's a, it sounds like the least bad option available, right? They may not, if they, they're putting it on paper, they may not write out first idea, bring in Americans. That probably wouldn't be it, right? Someone yesterday talked about using the whiteboard with vocabulary and stuff. So we were writing this up on the whiteboard. They wouldn't write, <laughs> bring in the Americans first. But if it's between bringing the Americans and abandon the territory because the Comanches are killing us, eh, the Tejanos are going to go with, let's just try the Americans and see what happens, right? It's kind of a Hail Mary pass. It's the, it's the least bad option they've got on the table. So let's give this one a shot and see what happens, right? But there was another reason that the Tejanos wanted, wanted this, all right? Is that the Tejanos made their living mostly by trading things and selling goods. And so what they would do is they would go to the place that was closest to get goods, which was New Orleans. And you guys remember we talked yesterday about New Orleans being this trade depot for everybody. It's your Walmart, it's your Home Depot, if you want stuff. And that was true for the Austin colony, but it's true for the Tejanos too. If you wanted stuff, you needed to go to New Orleans. And so these guys, like Navarro here, would leave San Antonio and then they would travel over to New Orleans and they would buy goods. And 
then come back. And they saw in New Orleans all this prosperity that they wanted for themselves. So if they bring in the Americans, they think maybe they can bring in economic progress as well, right? So the Tejanos are pretty stoked about Austin's proposal for three main reasons. Um, one, they just need people. I mean, it really doesn't matter if they come from Jupiter. Like, they just need people that are not Comanches <laughs> who live in the territory as a security thing for them because they're getting raided so much, right? They had also been so poor for so long that they really wanted to develop Texas economically. And they think bringing in these American farmers might bring the economy of New Orleans with them. And then that will probably develop the region in a way that will be good for the Tejanos too. So they see a big advantage there. And number three, the thing that I bolded once more, they do not think they're gonna get help from Mexico City. That's key because they feel like if they're going to develop the region, if they're going to protect themselves, if they're going to be able to get a prosperous future for themselves and their families, it's kind of up to them to find something to support that. Because they don't believe Mexico City is really going to put resources into any of this. Why do they, why do they think that? Because of everything they've experienced under the Spanish period. All right. So the point I want to make, and I really emphasize this with my students, I highly recommend you emphasize it with yours, is that Anglos found a very willing partner in the Tejanos. When Stephen F. Austin shows up, the Tejanos turn into really enthusiastic supporters of colonization, of bringing in the Americans, because it's in the, it's in the interest of the Tejanos. And so the way that Anglo colonization happens, it's a, it's a partnership between the Anglos and the Tejanos. And I want to emphasize that so much. The Anglos could not have done what they did. Stephen F. Austin, could not have done what he did without the Tejanos. He depends on them in so many ways, particularly in political support. And the Tejanos depend on him to help bring in these people that will develop the region. And so it's a partnership between these two sides that makes it possible. And so you guys remember yesterday, we talked all about the writing of the Constitution of 1824, right? And the debates that went on in Mexico City. Well, the Tejanos are representing Texas in Mexico City. They're, they're, they're at the, the, here in the House of, of Deputies, this image you guys see right here, as a part of those debates. And they're trying to support the Anglo colonists. Stephen F. Austin is there too. But it's the Tejanos who are at the desk saying, this is what we think. This is what we need to support. And it's the Tejanos who are helping push the writing of the Constitution of 1824 as a Federalist document. And you guys remember yesterday, right? We talked about how um, a federalist constitution gives certain powers to the national government in Mexico City, but it gave huge amounts of powers to the states to run their own affairs, right? Why do the Tejanos feel that way? Because everything we've talked about, they don't trust Mexico City to make decisions for them. They don't trust Mexico City to develop the region. They, they've seen the failures of that for so long that they think that they, the Tejanos and their Anglo partners will be able to best develop the region. So they feel really strongly that the constitution should be federalist, the states need to have a lot of power and that Texas needs to be its own state. So therefore the Tejanos are just as disappointed as the Anglos are that Texas is not its own state when Mexico gets going, right? And we talked about yesterday, this is another legacy of the failures of the Spanish to populate Texas. There's just not enough people, so Texas gets attached to Coahuila down here, right? And the Tejanos had actually tried to fight against that in Mexico City. They didn't want that to happen, but it happens. They can't really control it. But going forward, the Tejanos set their sights the way the Anglos do on developing the region the way they want to, which means Anglo immigration of cotton farmers coming in, and therefore, they look long term toward becoming having Texas eventually become its own state. So, we lead to the Texas Revolution. The thing that you need to remember and really make sure that our students understand is that the Tejanos are deeply committed Federalists, just like the Anglos, under the Constitution of 1824. They think it's going to, the Constitution will, will give them the powers they need to develop what they want. And so, the Tejanos are right there with the Anglos in lockstep about making Texas a separate state within Mexico, again, under the Constitution of 1824. 
They don't want Mexico City in charge of them. They want to be in charge of themselves. That is how they think this region will be able to develop, all right? And so you can see their perspectives on all of this um, in the way they describe things. So this is a, a document um, that I think is, it's a wonderful thing to use with, with your students. You know, we talked yesterday a lot about ways to approach the vocabulary, which I think is a really important thing for everybody, particularly 12 year olds if you're teaching seventh grade. Uh, but this is written by the Tejanos in San Antonio. There's, a, there's about 20 of them that got together in 1832. And they're mad, the, the, the context for this document is that they're mad about the law of April 6th, 1830. You guys remember we talked about that yesterday, right? The law of April 6th, 1830, it's where Mexico City starts trying to cut off American immigration, right? And it's Mexico City trying to reassert control in places like Texas. And so the Tejanos don't like any of that. They like the protections of the Constitution of 1824, and they like the idea of Texas being independent. So they're, they're, they're arguing against that. And so you guys can see here the way they describe it. They say, North Americans, Austin's colonists basically, reclaimed a considerable part of these lands from the desert prior to the passage of the law of April 6, 1830. And they toiled to further agriculture, introduce crafts known unknown in these parts since the discovery of this land by the old Spanish government. Basically, the Tanos are saying, look, the Anglos have developed in Austin's colony things that the Spanish never did, right? They're pointing to this and saying the Spanish failed and therefore we've been in a bad position. But now the Anglos are helping us develop the region. It's working really well. They said they planted cotton, sugar cane, introduced the co uh, cotton gin, imported machinery, all that stuff. We owe these advances to the efforts of these hardworking colonists. And then the quote I've bolded here is the one I always use with my students. And I think in terms of language and such to be really accessible to yours is from the Tejano perspective, immigration. When they say immigration, they mean of Anglo-Americans for coming to Austin's colony. Immigration is unquestionably the most efficient, quick and economical means we can employ to destroy the Indians. And they meant mostly the Comanches and to populate lands that they now occupy. This goal can only be achieved by freely admitting these enthusiast North Americans, all right? So they want to develop the region the way they've been wanting to develop the region, by bringing in the Americans. And so for those reasons, they, the Tejanos, again, want separate statehood. They don't want independence. They want separate statehood. And when Santa Ana overthrows the Constitution of 1824, they're not having it. Right? When Santa Ana comes in and overthrows the constitution in 1835 and says, Texas and the rest of Mexico are no longer independent states. You guys uh, aren't gonna have a constitution of 1824 because I've chucked it out the window. The Tejanos are just like, nope, not gonna do it, All right? But they're not rebelling from Mexico. They're rebelling from Santa Ana, right? And so you guys remember the first thing we talked about on Monday is that when Santa Ana overthrows this constitution, he starts a civil war in Mexico between federalists who like the constitution of 1824 and centralists like himself who want to consolidate power in Mexico City. The Tejanos see this as a civil war when it breaks out, but they're so deeply committed to the constitution of 1824 because they have been committed to developing the region for themselves because the failures of the Spanish and then really the inability of Mexico City to help them at any point has led them to believe this is what we need to tie into. So when the war breaks out in 1835, the Tejanos are enthusiastically against Santa Ana and are, are allies of the Anglo re rebels as well. And so the Anglo-Tejano alliance stays strong and comes together um, in the aftermath of, of this, this breakout, all right? So I'm gonna stop there. The next thing we're gonna talk about is Jose Antonio Navarro. But I'm going to hand it over to my good colleague and friend, Jay Ferguson, who is going to walk you guys through um, some of the pedagogical stuff that they've developed for the Tejano perspective. So I'll hand it over to you, Jay. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Ferguson. I teach Texas history at Canyon Vista Middle School in Round Rock ISD. And it's my pleasure to um, present to you um, the Tejano perspective. And when 
we had this opportunity to uh, work on this project with Dr. Torget. Um, I was pretty pumped because I, I teach Texas history from the perspective of trying to bring in the voices as much as I possibly can. Because like you, um, it is pretty much one-sided. And I tell my kids that. My kids even question that. They always ask me questions about, well, whatever happened to such and such? So um, this was a fun journey for me um, to play with these primary sources. Uh, this is the actual unit plan, much similar to what Michelle presented yesterday. Um, we have Tejanos in the Texas Revolution, which we're going to talk about today. Um, I have these, I just realized this, I have these out of order. We should have Navarro first, then Seguin. So, um, but again, that's just me as a teacher. I, it, that pains me to see this, um, but I'll figure it out later. Um, and then one of the things I really want to point your attention to is because I saw in the chat, hey, primary sources, citations, etc. Um, if you want to get deeper into bringing voice to your classroom, I'm going to give you today um, some Tejano perspectives from obviously Seguin and Navarro, but also to um, some other voices in there. But these are some of the main voices, the um, resources that I used. Um, biography of, of Jose Antonio Navarro, that is on the portal, which you can definitely grab that if you'd like to. Um, but these are some really good ones. Seeds of Empire um, really is a good guiding point for this lesson um, as well, too. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention so you see that piece of it. Um, and I'd like to jump over to the Tejano perspective that we're going to spend a little time. So the way I did this activity was to theme it out. And the theme behind this is much what you just already heard from Dr. Torget when he gave his presentation give a little bit of background information on this. I would typically use this in my classroom as an activity as possibly a hook going into it. Um, as we go through some other lessons that we're gonna bring to you, I can definitely tell you where I, where I use it. Um, we've got a background document, um, which really what I tried to do is tell you kind of about what this document's about. The thing I've discovered is when I see primary source documents, great. How can I use it? So on these, what I'm really trying to do is show that um, much like we just heard, Mexico's failure to establish settlements in Texas, um, but you know, with the Tejanos with the help of Stephen F. Austin, um, and you'll see I also have primary source information built into even my background information. Um, but it's truly showing how Austin is petitioning um, Mexico and the state uh, government in Saltillo on how to um, you know, where the problems lie. And as we've already learned that most of Texas struggles were because of lack of attention. Um, so these would be to me a, a good start um, into my, my presentation to my students where we would probably take this particular document itself, the background information. Um, I don't know if I would do all the analysis questions. Um, I try to kind of think this through as if you wanted to treat this as a DBQ, you could. Uh, but again, it's, it's more along the lines of, you could be basically plug and play this any way you would like to. I would basically plug and play, take the first part and then pick one question as a warm up into my lesson itself. Um, document B is talking about the perspective of how proud the Tejanos are of this um, Anglo colonization in the Texas. Um, we have a direct quote. Um, this leads the Tejanos also now into a conflict with the conservatives in Mexico City, which adds a little bit more fuel to the fire that Dr. Torgut was talking about as well, too. Um, so we see an excerpt um, and we see what they're doing and what the benefit is. Um, this could be also used as an exit, exit ticket um, with my students before they walk out the door, pull one question, um, have them use the background information of document B and ask the question, you know, what do the Tejanos suggest the Anglo-Americans are going to bring to Texas or impact the Texas agricultural industry. Um, so I try to be offer you a, a lot of variety associated with it. And then document C um, is recognizing that Texas needs to have um, somewhat of its you know, new government. Um, they're asking repeatedly, they're, you know, you, we see it that, hey, we need help. Um, and then they start to realize that we're not gonna get help. Um, so they truly look to the immigration piece as this is what's going to help us. This is not only going to help us economically, um, but it's also going to help create a buffer zone 
between us and the Comanches and the Apaches associated with it. Um, and again, you could pull this one out itself as an exit ticket, or you can you use it as a um, within a piece of your presentation. Um, so we have three documents that you can use. I, I in my classroom, I have taken standard DBQs, and I'll take just a section of it and literally put it within my um, presentation to my students um, as they're working on taking notes and trying to, to digest this information. But then we kind of stop. It's kind of like that little bit of that segue to where we um, have them take this information or maybe just take this quote here and then in a small group or elbow partner or you know whatever type of small group you want to put together, um, ask them one question. Um, pick one question that, or you may have another question of a direction you want to take this and then have them at that point in time as a group answer that question. And then we turn and as a classroom, we have a, a, a mini class discussion. And then we get back into the normal um, process of what we're trying to do um, with say note taking or whatever the case may be. But it, it, this design of this lesson activity can be manipulated many different ways. You can treat it as one document. Um, you could just take it out and go to certain segments. But um, the idea behind this, I was thinking, what can I do with this? If I was a teacher on your, in your position, how am I going to use this? So I try to give you as much background as I possibly can on each of the documents, um, the discussion of the documents, Questions, um, try to keep them specifically tied. One of the things, that, one strategy I do do with my students is um, as we read, um, first I go to the questions. I'm having my students first and foremost, we will discuss the questions first. And I call it reading like a historian. I gotta, I'm reading for a purpose. So I will discuss the questions. We will discuss them. What do you think they mean by this? We, don't, we typically don't know anything yet. And then as we go through the reading, we will annotate or highlight as we read. I have my students do various colors to answer question one, two, and three. So we'd have three different colors possibly on, online. Um, again, going back to the strategy we talked about the other day, um, you could bold something if you don't know what that word means as a new vocabulary term. Um, and I did this last year when we were all online and my students got really quick with trying to find, you know, explore or define terms. And I would have my students actually reach out to the classroom and discuss, hey, I found this, what this term means and how, to, how can we use it as a sentence? And, you know, it, it was more interactive. Um, in the classroom this year, I still plan to do the same thing. Um, but in the past, I've had hard copies to where we've actually annotated, highlighted. Uh, but that's one strategy that I use that I find that's very, very productive and helps them with their writing aspect of it as well too. So with that, I would turn it back over to Dr. Torgan. And if you have any questions at the end or even now, throw them in the chat and we can go from there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. Perfection. All right. So I'm going to go back to share my screen. Um, I love the chat. I was, while, while Jay was talking, walking through a lot of that stuff with you guys, I was looking through the chat. Some fantastic questions. Um, if, if I don't get, I'm trying to direct message a lot of people with answers back um, when it's history type questions. If we don't get to it, if I don't get to it, we'll address anything you've got at the end as long as you guys have questions. So, but as Jay said, please keep throwing stuff in there. I also love, as I keep saying, you guys are talking to each other and getting ideas and answering each other's questions. I think the more conversation, again, y'all are each other's best resources. So take advantage of that. I think that's fantastic. Um, one thing that did show up in the chat I wanted to address before I dive into our good friend Navarro here is the question of terminology. Y'all were asking about um, what should we use, Indians or Native Americans when we talk about the Native groups that lived in Texas. And I, I wrote a little response in the chat um, this is a common question, so I wanted to address it real fast, is that most um, Native groups tend to prefer American Indians now. And so that's typically what I use in the classroom, but any of those work. You can use Indians, American Indians, um, Native Americans. Um, I, I think as long as you're, you know, doing it um, as, as best you can, I don't think any one of those terms tends to work. Mostly I try to just use the names of groups like Comanche, Apache, whatever it might end up being. Um, but it, where I work and what I do, that tends to be the standard using American Indians. Um, on Tejanos, do we call them Tejanos? Do we call them Mexicans, Mexican-Americans? It gets confusing because 
the Navarro's we're going to talk about, you know, where he was changed, he's the same. It's still Navarro, right? But he's a Spaniard and he's a Mexican and then he's a, a citizen of the Republic of Texas and then he's um, a citizen of the United States as Texas changes politics. I use Tejano to just kind of have some consistency across all of that. Tejano, of course, is just Spanish for Texas, all it says. So I think of it as ethnic Mexicans who are from Texas. I use Tejano kind of as a catch-all. Did they refer to themselves as Tejanos? Um, they refer to themselves as being from Texas. They didn't really use the word Tejano a whole lot necessarily. Um, Tejano has kind of been a term that academics have used ever since to sort of just be able to refer to them consistently, even though um, the territory changes a lot. So that's why I tend to use Tejano. I think it's 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 about as accurate as we're we're going to be able to get. So I just wanted to give um, to give that one as a as a possibility. All right, so. Let's dive into a couple of biographies because I find those work really well in my classroom. And it makes real a lot of these ideas about Mexico and federalism because it puts it in the body of a real human being. And my students react really well to that. I'm, I'm guessing y'all will as well. And I'm gonna tell the story here of Jose Antonio Navarro, which he's a big figure in the Teats, an important figure obviously um, in Texas history writ large. And Navarro, he was, he was born in, 1795, all right, which he's he's basically born at the end of the Spanish era in Texas. And he really grows up with the failures of the Spanish kind of all around him. Um, he was born in 1795, so that means it was just two years after the Spanish started abandoning the mission system and tried to find any way uh, around all of that. He grew up in San Antonio, and when he grew up in San Antonio, he grew up very impoverished, right? He's a very poor place because of all the violence that has been going on all around him. So he's there um, when the missions have been failing. He's there during the Gutierrez McGee expedition. In fact, he wrote about it later in life and just how violently horrific it was. He saw the men who came back from killing the governor of Texas that were part of the Gutierrez McGee expedition. They says they were just smeared in blood from, from that horrific act. And he's all of 18 years old, by the way when this happened. So he's he's a young man, just barely out of being a teenager. And you know, these are his very formative years when he's seeing this violence and chaos all around him and things are falling apart. And then, um, you know, after the Battle of Medina, this is an artist rendition um, of, of the violence of that, you know, he has to abandon San Antonio. Because what I talked about a little earlier with Jose Joaquin de Arredondo, right? The guy who was sent from Mexico City to reclaim Texas. When Arredondo's army marches into San Antonio, they're gonna kill anybody they think was a part of the Gutierrez McGee expedition and the rebellion. And so Navarro is one of about a thousand Tejanos who have to abandon Texas because of the violence that comes with the war for Mexican independence. He has to leave San Antonio here to, and I don't mean like just walk away slowly, like he has to run, <laughs> he has to get out fast unless Arredondo's army is gonna catch him. And he goes from San Antonio. So you guys see right here on the map, he goes from San Antonio up the Camino Real. He goes to Nacogdoches. A lot of Tejanos did that. You know, they're crossing rivers, which were not easy to cross back then. There's no big bridges or anything like that. And they're trying to get away before Spanish troops are going to catch them. He gets to Nacogdoches, and then it's not safe to stay in Nacogdoches. He ends up going into Louisiana, all right? And he will live in Louisiana for three years, from 1813 to 1816. Because Navarro shows up in Louisiana at that exact moment, Navarro is in the United States for one of the biggest transformations that's ever happened in the United States that will have an enormous effect on Texas, right? So you guys see this map right here, right? This is, um, you know, the Mississippi River Valley. Here's the Mississippi River. This is Louisiana, obviously. Um, Mississippi, Alabama. This is kind of the, what becomes the deep south, right? And you guys see all these arrows here on the map? This is the pathways that people from the, the rest of the United States came down to Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. And they did it in the mid 18 teens. At the same moment Navarro comes into Louisiana, all these Americans are coming down to Louisiana too and Mississippi and Alabama. Why are they all coming down here, all right? The reason they're coming down here is that they're gonna grow cotton, all right? They're gonna build cotton farms. 
And this is what's becoming the epicenter of the American South and the expansion of cotton that's going to transform the United States, right? Which your students that are taking seventh grade with you will be taking eighth grade U.S. history. They're going to run into this again, all right? Um, and the way that the reason that this is all happening is because the British Empire, had, as a part of, of, of expanding its textile industry, so you guys can see here, this is these are these are textile machines that are taking cloth or taking raw materials and turning them into cloth. This is how the British made a lot of their money. And they had done it for a very long time with wool, but they realized that it would be much more efficient and they could sell a whole lot more uh, textiles if they had something like cotton, which they could get a lot more of and probably get a lot cheaper. So in the early 1800s, the, the, the English empire transitioned from making cloth out of wool to making it with cotton. When they did that, they put out a massive call for cotton. And they said they would pay, you know, basically top dollar for cotton. And in 1815, the price of cotton doubled from 15 cents a pound to 30 cents a pound, right? And that's what produced this massive migration down to Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, because everybody was running down there as fast as they could to grow cotton to sell it to the British. Because um, you can make an enormous amount of money doing it. And so people pour down to this region to do this. You guys see this is a this is a cotton farm, a cotton plantation, really, right? These big fields full of cotton. And if you can, you know, you can pick it, clean it, and bale it. These are cotton bales down here on the left, these big blocks that weighed 450 pounds each. You could put up those onto this um, steamboat here in the background. You guys see the steamboat? That'll go down to New Orleans, and you can sell it from New Orleans out to the rest of the world you can make an enormous amount of money, all right? And so people from the United States poured down to Mississippi, Alabama to grow cotton. Now this will be important and we'll talk about this more on Thursday, but a lot of the people who are coming down are not coming voluntarily. When you think of Mississippi cotton plantations, I'm guessing you also think of slavery because slave labor was what made those cotton farms extremely profitable. And so 40% of all the people who are being coming down to Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, are not coming voluntarily. They're men, women, and children who've been enslaved, who are being brought by masters who own them to pick cotton in the fields. And this was very widespread. Um, every, by 1820, every third person in Alabama was a slave. Um, half, half of all Louisianans were slaves um, by the time Navarro arrives. In, in Louisiana, right? So he, he would have seen all of this and that's gonna be really important uh, in a little bit. The other thing Navarro would have seen while he's there, I mean, he would have seen the cotton ports, he would have seen New Orleans and all the wealth that cotton was bringing in. He would have seen slavery as, as the engine that's driving a lot of this stuff. And he would have seen just what a massive migration this produced. So by 1820, you guys can see, there's over 150,000 people in Louisiana, there's 75,000 in Mississippi, and there's 144,000 in, in Alabama. If you add all that up, which I am not good at math, so I used a calculator for this, but if you do that, it's 370,000 people, all right, more than a third of a million that have moved into this region within only five years, from 1815 to 1820. Navarro sees all that. He sees the development. He sees the rapid development of this region and how much wealth it brings in. And he's like, that's amazing. Look at that. That's incredible. Boy, it'd be nice if we had that where we live in Texas, where you can see right here, there's only about 3,000 Tejanos in the aftermath of the violence from the Spanish era, all right? Now, Navarro comes back in 1816 um, to San Antonio. Um, his mother helps get him a, a pardon and he comes back. He's, you know, he's, he's a very young man. He's about 21 years old when he comes back. And, you know, San Antonio had never been in a good position anyway, is now a shell of its former self, right? Things are just decimated. The, the Indian raids have been awful. They continue to be awful. Things are just falling apart. We talked about this um, earlier. The, that's why Navarro is a big supporter of the Austin proposal. Because when Moses Austin comes in and then Stephen you know, follows up, what the Austins are proposing, again, is to bring in the cotton economy, right? To bring in these American farmers. And Navarro has seen that, right? He's, he lived there for three years. He's seen it firsthand. He knows what it can do. 
He knows how powerful a transformation that can affect and how Louisiana had gone and turned into this incredibly wealthy place as a result of that. Navarro wants that for Texas. He wants that for San Antonio. He wants that for his family. And so we talked about why Tejanos thought this was a good idea. Navarro, more than anyone, saw that firsthand and experienced it for himself and wanted it, wanted it so very bad. All right. So Navarro is a fundamental partner of Stephen F. Austin and the Anglo um, colonization project from the very word go. Um, and he feels very strongly that this is an important thing to invest in. It's going to be important for Texas long term. And that's important too, because Navarro is increasingly important amongst the Tejanos. Navarro is one of the political figures that his fellow Tejanos respect and, and elevate in terms of power and influence. You can see he becomes the very first alcalde, basically mayor, of San Antonio after Mexico becomes independent. Right? He was a very young man when that happened. He's in his early 20s, all right? so, uh, or mid-20s, I guess, when that happens. right? He becomes the land commissioner for Green DeWitt's colony, which is just to the west of Stephen F. Austin's colony. It's the only colony besides Austin's colony that mildly succeeds. Um, and, which, and the reason that's important is that it shows Navarro actively working with the Tejanos in colonization. Right? He's, he's actually a partner in the DeWitt colony as the land commissioner over there, right? And even more important, he served as one of the two Texas representatives to the Coahuila, Texas legislature in Saltillo during the late 1820s. And this, I'm gonna flag you guys, if you're writing notes, write this down, this is important. This is the, the, the special role that Tejanos play during the 1820s, is that they represent Texas in all political matters, right? They represent Texas in Mexico City and they represent Texas in Saltillo. So, Everything that the Tejanos want done and that the Anglos want done has to go through the Tejanos. The Anglos cannot succeed at anything if they don't have a willing partnership and really the outright endorsement of the Tejanos and whatever the scheme is and whatever the idea that might be at play. So this is really key, all right? And that's gonna matter because what's going on in Texas is gonna need a whole lot of support from the Tejanos, all right? And the best example of that is something we'll talk about again on Thursday, but the state constitution of Coahuila, Texas, it was written in 18, was published in 1827, right? Now, we talked yesterday about the, the constitution of 1824, Mexico's national constitution, it's federalist constitution, right? It gave a lot of powers to the states. That meant the states had to write their own state constitutions to decide how are things gonna go, what's gonna happen, right? And so Coahuila, Texas wrote a state constitution that was gonna determine how they're gonna run their own affairs. And you can see right here, it was published in both Spanish and in English. I love pointing that out. It's a fun thing for the students because um, it was the only state constitution in Mexico published bilingually. And the reason they did that, of course, is that the Anglo colonists needed to be able to read the constitution. So they published it in English too. But here's the thing about this. When the Coahuila legislature got together, it's mostly made up of Coahuilans. There's only one Texas representative when they're writing this constitution. And most of those Coahuilans wanted to outlaw slavery. Yeah. And we'll talk more about that on Thursday when we talk about the African-American experience in Texas, but um, most Coahuilans wanted to get rid of slavery. And they wrote in article 13 of this constitution that they were gonna outlaw it but really slowly, they came up with this really kind of convoluted sort of system. The idea they said was like, okay, you guys have cotton farms, you guys are bringing in slaves. And there were a lot of slaves in Texas. Um, as early as 1825, 25% of Austin's colony was made up entirely of enslaved people. Um, Article 13 said, okay, you guys have cotton farms, that's great. You guys have slaves, we don't really wanna keep those. So what we're gonna do is everybody who's currently a slave in Texas will remain a slave for the rest of their lives. And in fact, we're gonna give you guys a six month window. If you need more slaves, bring them in from New Orleans and load up, bring them all in. All of those people will be slaves for the rest of their lives. Um, but we're gonna free the children of those slaves. So 
So the way Article 13 was written, what it said was, is that all slaves currently in Texas and that any that come in for the next six months will be slaves for the rest of their lives, but the children of those slaves will become free themselves. So, you know, it'll it'll take about a generation for freedom to come, but long-term slavery will be over in Texas. So that was written into the state constitution. And the Coelans who wrote most of that thought this was a very reasonable way to get rid of slavery because it would take a long time. They weren't gonna confiscate anybody's slaves right away or actually ever. And you know the, the Texans would be very calm and relaxed about that. But they were wrong. The Texans were not calm and relaxed about that. Stephen F. Austin thought this was a major crisis and so did the Tejanos, all right? And I wanna emphasize again, the Tejanos are in the same, they have the same perspective really as the Anglos because they both want the same thing. They want American immigration because those Americans are gonna come in to grow cotton because it'll develop economically the region. And they both think slavery is necessary to make that happen. And the reason is they figure no one's gonna leave Mississippi and farming cotton there if you can do it with slavery there and come to Mexico if you can't do it with slavery here. Because if you can do it with slaves, you can get a lot more money. So they figure no one's gonna come unless they can continue bringing their slaves. This is a significant problem. So Austin and his colonists come up with a scheme to get around this prohibition on slavery. And the scheme they come up with is kind of clever. We'll talk more about it on, on Thursday, but the basic idea is that they come up with an idea of like, what if we don't call it slavery? <laughs> what if we call it contracted labor? And so they wanna get a law passed in Saltillo that says, if you sign a contract in the United States, that contract is legal in Mexico, which sounds really innocent, right? But it has to sound really innocent because they want, to, they need to get that law passed. But what are they gonna do with the law? Well, the idea is that if you're coming to Austin's colony and you're coming from Mississippi and you're bringing slaves with you, you'll free them in Louisiana on your way but in exchange for their freedom, those now former slaves will sign contracts that will bind them for 99 years to work for you as a indentured servant, right? And, and so it's just a legal ruse to get around a prohibition on slavery. You're just gonna call it something else. It's still the same thing, it's still slavery. You're gonna call it something else, right? So that's, that's Austin's idea, but can he pass that by himself? No, he cannot. What does he need? He needs the Tejanos to help. And so he sends this to San Antonio where it gets in the hands of Jose Antonio Navarro. And Navarro, he thinks, what's his reaction? What do you think his reaction is? I always ask my students, what do you think he would do? And the answer is, he's like, great idea. Why didn't I think of this? This is fantastic. Because the, the Tejanos want to keep Anglo immigration coming in. They think slavery is necessary for doing that. So if this is a way around that, they're gonna be on board. And so Navarro takes this to the Saltillo legislature and he gets it passed as something called, um, as something called Decree 56, right? And we'll break down Decree 56 on Thursday in a little bit more detail. But it's, it's basically a, a law that says you can have contracts signed in the United States or legal in Mexico, and that's used to keep slavery alive for at least a little while um, throughout all of this. All right. So Navarro is a very willing participant in that. He helps get that, that law passed. And the reason he does it is the same reason he supports the Constitution of 1824 and why he's a Federalist, because he wants to develop the region, because the failures of the region have been so abysmal up until this point. And so for Navarro, he feels very strongly that this must be developed. He's very committed, therefore, to Federalism, to the Constitution of 1824, and therefore separate statehood for Texas. Right? He is one of many, many people who is pushing for separate statehood for Texas. So this petition I showed you guys earlier, and I won't read it again, but we talked about it, right? Where the Tejanos are, are saying how much they support Anglo immigration. Navarro is one of the guys who wrote this document, right? So it encapsulates a lot of his ideas and perspective about why Anglo immigration is not just important, but the only way to achieve what they want to achieve, as they say in this document, right? And as a result, Navarro sees what's going on in Mexico City with the rise to power of Santa Ana, or Santana, as he was called at the time, with, with a lot of alarm. 
right? And so you can see right here in 1834, Navarro, he was writing to a, a friend of his, Samuel May Williams. He warned that the rise of centralism under Santa Ana meant, quote, militarism and civil death of sacrosanct liberty. And that he would rather see Texas, quote, reduced to ashes than live as a slave under a despotic government. This is in 1834. This is a year before Santa Ana overthrows the constitution. So you can imagine when he does, Navarro is, it's full on civil war in Mexico, centralist versus federalist. Navarro's on the federalist side, the anti-Santa Ana side, the let's restore the constitution of 1824 side in all of this. And he feels very, very strongly about that, all right? Now, when the war breaks out, Navarro cannot participate in the fighting because he, as a child, he had an injury uh, to one of his legs. So he, couldn't, he couldn't march. He couldn't walk long distances. He often needed a cane. You can see him in this, this image, which was taken, this image was taken later in his life, but he's steadying himself with a chair um, because he, he wasn't able to, to move as easily as he would need to to serve in the Texas Army. But he nonetheless supported independence very, very actively. And so he is elected by the Tejanos to represent Behar, Behar County, basically, but San Antonio um, at, the, at Washington on the Brazos when they have the meeting that um, declares Texas independence. Now, I want to loop this back to what we talked about on Monday real fast. You guys will remember that everybody in Texas was pretty divided amongst themselves throughout most of the revolution, right? They can't decide if they want to fight. And even if they do want to fight, what are they fighting for, right? And so Washington on the Brazos, you know, the, the, the gathering there in early March that declares Texas independence, that's a big shift. That's a watershed moment because that is where Texans finally get together and decide they're fighting for independence and they try to really get their house in order. Why do they do that? Why do they suddenly get clarity? We talked about it on Monday. It's because Santa Ana has invaded and he has the Alamo now under siege. And they realize if they don't get on the same page, they're going to be in some serious trouble. Right? Now, Washington and the Brazos was almost exclusively um, Anglo-Americans. All right? There's about 58 delegates and almost all of them are Anglo-Americans. The exceptions are, um, you have Lorenzo de Zavala from Yucatan. So we have a Mexican politician who hates Santa Ana, who's there. But you have two Tejanos, all right, two Mexicans native to Texas. You have Antonio Navarro here, and then on our left, you also have Jose Francisco Ruiz, who was Navarro's uncle, all right? So Ruiz is the uncle, Navarro is the nephew, and so these guys are representing Texas um, at, at, at the Washington and the Brazos Convention. And I want to emphasize, up until this point, almost all Tejanos were very much a part of this war and very much against Santa Ana. But again, they're doing this in the context of a civil war within Mexico. So it's a very much against Santa Ana and in favor of the constitution of 1824. That's what they were mostly supporting. So for most Tejanos, that was the perspective they'd had up until this point. Independence was not a very big popular idea amongst most Tejanos throughout most of this. So when the convention decides to adapt the Declaration of Independence on March 6th, sorry, March 2nd, March 6th when the Alamo falls, March 2nd, 1836. This is a, this is a big break and it's mostly being driven by the Anglo-Americans. The question is, what do the Tejanos do? And as you guys know, because the Teeks name Ruiz and Navarro for this reason, um, both Navarro and the Ruiz signed the declaration, all right? And I love using this image. I find these images are really powerful for my students to actually see things like the signature of, this is Francisco Ruiz up here, and then right below it is J for Jose Antonio Navarro, all right? And there's a lot of accounts from this period that suggest that Navarro hesitated. It's not that he was hesitating and being against Santa Ana, he'd been very vocal about that, but the jump to full independence was, a really big shift for everybody, but particularly for the Tejanos. And so he thought about it, but he commits to it and he signs his name, which if they lost, that was like signing your own death warrant. So this is not a small matter to be signing your name to this, this document. And both Ruiz and Navarro do it um, and are again on the side of the, with the Anglo-Americans in the fight that comes. 
then things get pretty fast and furious for Navarro after that. While all this is going on, you know, the Alamo has already fallen. Goliad, um, Goliad is massacre happens, and Santa Ana starts marching towards Sam Houston as fast as he possibly can. Navarro um, leaves the convention with his uncle, and then they travel to New Orleans, and or they travel to Nacogdoches, and then from there they go over to New Orleans. So Navarro is actually in Louisiana by the end of the revolution itself. Um, and doesn't participate in any of the fighting necessarily, but um, he is a key statesman in this entire process. And what I love using his life for is to explain the Tejano perspective throughout all of this in a way that connects, again, we talk about day one, connecting units from the Spanish colonial period to the Mexican national period up to the revolution itself. So next we're gonna talk about Juan Seguin and fighting in the revolution for Tejanos, but I'm gonna pause here and turn it back over to Jay lead you guys through some more documents. Thank you. All right. So this document, which I've noticed you guys are actually kind of popping into looking at it as well. Um, I tried to on this one, the theme behind this one was to really kind of follow through what Dr. Torgit was talking about. I don't know about you guys, but I mean, that little snippet of Texas history um, I don't know where you would find it in any textbook or any any other resource out there. So I kind of felt like, you know what, let's keep it the same theme. And the idea behind Navarro, I give the background information much like you just heard um, again. And um, you can definitely use this photograph as a great opportunity to talk to your students. Um, you can even go further back. Um, his memoirs do talk about how he was injured, which is a, to me, I did not know that. Um, so I found like I felt like that was really um, something that could be relatable in the classroom. Um, the documents, document A, the, these all follow his fight to keep the institution of slavery in Texas. Um, this first one's talking about Degree 56 um, to where he's talking to Austin about this and say, hey, listen, this is what I'm able to do. Um, we're going to keep this system in place, much like Dr. Torgut mentioned. Um, this whole idea between the San Antonio Tejanos going back to the perspective of why they're joining this. Um, they're, they're really wanting to keep this, this institution around. They, re they recognize that um, um, slavery, the institution of slavery that is going to push the cotton industry in Texas is going to be a big boom for Texas itself. Um, so we have a conversation here of what he's doing um, and has a primary source document is actually a letter to Austin. So this is this is his letter. Um, this comes from um, Seeds of Empire, um, which he talks about um, the actual end. And now yesterday we talked about what happens if we see this good fortune to gain um, the law. That may be difficult for a seventh grade mind. So I, I have taken a little bit of a liberty and added into it to achieve um, and I do this sometimes too, depending upon what the activity is, okay. um, to help speed through so we don't spend a ton of time searching for things. There are certain words that I may have highlighted that I want my students to at least explore, like we talked about uh, the last time we were together. Um, so what we're trying to really get the students to think about is this decree of 56, where it basically, um, it's a workaround for banning slavery and adopting a system that Mexico and Spain has seen for a while. Uh, Peenage, where they um, are in some form of a debt servitude into a system. And um, I believe this is um, upwards to, they could factor it up to 99 years. So this is a different take on it. And then document B is talking about article 13 that outlaws it. And this is where um, Jose um, Navarro talks about fighting for, if we do this, it's going to be the doom to um, Texas itself. Um, and finally, on document C, we have another letter from Navarro to Austin in 1829. Um, this is written in the aftermath of uh, Guerrero's administration's announcement to completely outlaw slavery in 1829. Um, and this is Austin, or Navarro talking to Austin um, trying to make the case on what would happen if we, again, cancel it or, or amend annulment. Again, this is a new word for our seventh grade minds. 
and trying to help them understand this. You could break this up into this is now this one is a big letter. You could actually chunk this out to um, the three paragraphs. I've done that a lot is I see a big piece I want to talk about and where we see Navarro is still wanting to um, support this. He wants to, you know, this decree needs to be amended or canceled. Um, and we can have conversations in the classroom paragraph by paragraph. You can actually break this apart and, and take out some of the, I guess, the not too much of the context, but enough to, to keep the context in there and have conversations with, within the classroom of small group. Um, this particular decree in this letter to Austin is a good one to have the students do the small groups. Um, you could actually um, do a, you know, around the classroom with all of these, take all of these different conversations. Um, that Navarro has with Austin and what he's trying to do, um, give the background information to help support the context for the students so they can at least get some ideas, and then do just a station. Um, I've done that a lot to where we have, have a worksheet um, where I take some of the analysis questions and then just as a group, as they go from place to place, um, analyze and answer the questions. I've also done this too with post-it notes um, where I have them respond on a post-it note um, based upon what, what, what it is they're reading. So that's a fun activity, gets them up, gets them moving around. But at the same time, um, they're actually able to give their opinions of what they are interpreting these primary source documents are providing. So with that, um, this is Antonio, excuse me, Jose Antonio Navarro. Um, I kind of, and I try to give a, a, a catchy phrase, he's the, to me, the Tejano colonizer of of Texas working in cahoots with Stephen F. Austin as we've learned. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Dr. Torriot and we can find out about our last Tejano. <laughs> I like that, I like that. Um, not the last, but the last we'll talk about today. That's good stuff. Um, and we'll get to revisit too on, on Friday when we talk about connections from the revolution going forward. Um, so thank you, Jay, that's all fantastic stuff. I love these resources. I love the chat. I was in there um, answering some questions, direct messaging folks, um, but I love the conversation you guys are having back and forth. Um, and you know, the slavery issue obviously elicits a lot of discussion and is a bit in the news recently when it comes to stuff. Um, we'll talk a lot more about that on Thursday. So we're gonna really dive into that with some really great depth. I'm not deferring any questions. We can talk as much about that as you guys want to in the Q&A session at the end. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know, we'll get, a, we'll get a chance to really dive into some of those issues even more deeply um, on Thursday. We brought it up with Navarro because he plays such a key role. Um, and understanding the Tejano perspective, which is what today is all about, uh, is really important in looking at, you know, his experiences in Louisiana. I mean, again, emphasizing your students, like, he was there for three years. He saw a lot of these things in the United States. So when Austin shows up, it's not like he's not like Navarro's never met an American before, right? This is something he's familiar with, intimately familiar with. And so he has a perspective um, that is built on his life experience, as we as we all do with most things, right? Speaking of which, let's dive into Juan Seguin, who um, is also very much in the teeps and often gets mentioned um, because of it. So a lot of us, I think, are at least somewhat familiar with uh, Juan's, uh, I say Juan like we're friends, um, but I, I like Juan, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say yes to that. Um, because he's, you know, he's in the Alamo, he's then later at San Jacinto, but I don't think most of us have a really good sense of the arc of his story as well. And again, a lot of what we keep talking about is it's so powerful to make connections between units for our students so that they can see how history builds on itself over time and that they feel like the experts when they get to the revolution and they realize, well, I know about what happened in the Spanish colonial period and that was a problem. And then under Mexico with the constitution and why they saw, I mean, when they can add things up over time and then feel like they've got some insight from there. I don't know about your students, mine really get a kick at it. Thing. So I like telling the broad story of someone like Juan Seguin because it embodies so much of this. Stuff, right? Now Juan here, he was um, younger than Navarro. He was born in 1806. So he's 11 years younger than Navarro. And, you know, Navarro was old enough to really experience the chaos of the Spanish period. Um, Seguin, Juan Seguin here kind of did, but he was a kid. And 
again, my, I have a 13 year old and an 11 year old at home, and they're very good at being oblivious to things. I'm not sure if Juan was, but um, my, my kids are pretty good at sort of just not noticing stuff. Um, so Juan's growing up with all that. We're not sure how much of that he saw or understood, but he grew up in San Antonio and he, he, he had to be pretty well aware of the late 18 teens chaos because that's when he's a teenager and he's experiencing all of that. Um, so all those Indian raids we talked about, all that violence that happened, it definitely had a big effect on his father, Erasmo Seguin, who is also in the Teaks and is a really important figure. And Erasmo Seguin becomes an important, I wish I had a picture of him, I'd put it up here right now, but I don't. Erasmo Seguin becomes a very important figure in all of these stories uh, as well. He's a leading Tejano from San Antonio. And like Navarro, Erasmo Seguin becomes a big partner of Stephen F. Austin. In fact, this is a great fact or a great factor to throw at your students. When, when Stephen F. Austin rides into Texas for the first time in July of 1821, he is being led into Texas by 14 Tejanos. And the, the lead captain of those Tejanos is Erasmo Seguin. So it is Juan Seguin's dad, Erasmo, who leads Stephen F. Austin into Texas for the first time to make sure that you know, Steve doesn't get lost on his way and brings him in, brings him to San Antonio. You know, Erasmo is like Jose Antonio Navarro. They're very interested in bringing in Americans, cotton farming, economic development, all the stuff that can come with that, all right? And so when Texas, uh, well, when Mexico starts writing its national constitution that we've talked about a whole bunch, um, Texas sends representatives to Mexico City to write that constitution. Who was the Texas representative that went down there? Juan's father, Erasmo Seguin, right? It is Erasmo Seguin who leaves Texas, goes to Mexico City, who is sitting here in this House of Deputies here, writing the Constitution of 1824, and is the representative for Texas with the, the lead seat at the table, right? So it's Navarro who helps write this Federalist document, right? Um, and Erasmo Seguin, sorry, it's Erasmo Seguin who helps write this, this document. And so, you know, Juan's growing up with his dad, as the guy who helped write this constitution and his dad, who's a very committed federalist, who believes very strongly that Texas should be able to determine its own affairs, because that's the only way it's gonna develop, because Mexico City is never really gonna help, is what Erasmo's perspective is. And so, you know, as a teenager, Juan Seguin, you know, experiences all of that. He's also very young. When, when Stephen F. Austin comes into Texas for the very first time, Juan Seguin's only 15 years old which since you guys have a lot of 12 year olds, most of you in your classes, he's as close in age as I think they're gonna get to a lot of these people besides um, uh, Esparza um, kid. But uh, Juan Seguin, you know, he, he gets to know Austin because Austin comes to San Antonio. Um, he gets to know the Anglos as a result. Juan Seguin becomes very good friends with them. Um, Stephen F. Austin sends his brother, a guy named James Brown Austin, to San Antonio to live with the Seguin family and learn Spanish there. And so, you know, basically Juan Seguin is roommates with Stephen F. Austin's brother for a while in San Antonio. So I want to emphasize again, that Anglo-Tejano alliance, right, is very strong and very tightly connected. And it's really part of the formative uh, period of Juan Seguin's life when he's transitioning from a teenager into an adult in his early 20s. And so, Juan Seguin, you know, again, just as best as Navarro does, represents that, that alliance. Um, Seguin also comes, Juan Seguin comes from, you know, the Seguin family. And they are very politically influential within San Antonio. They're very politically connected in San Antonio. There's a very small handful of families that control most of the business in town. The, the Ruizes, the Navarros, the Seguins, the Veramindis. Um, and so Juan here, coming from the Seguin family, gets involved in Texas politics, you know, at a fairly young age. Um, I mentioned earlier, Navarro, Jose Antonio Navarro became alcalde uh, in his mid-20s of San Antonio, and Juan Seguin does as well. Seguin was elected alcalde of San Antonio and appointed interim jefe politico, which is basically political head of, of the Bejar district, in 1834. Right, two years before the Texas Revolution. And I say that simply to point out that like he is deeply connected to the Anglo experiment, very supportive of it, a strong Federalist. And he has clearly the support of his fellow Tejanos. 
because they're electing him to leadership positions. He's not, you know, off on the edge. He's not some crazy guy that no one likes. He's right in the middle and has a broad amount of support from, from Tejanos um, all around him. And he is a deeply, as I keep saying, committed Federalist, much like Navarro, much like his father, Seguin, Rasmus Seguin. And his dad helped write this document, so I wouldn't expect any less of it. But the reason Navarro, or Juan Seguin here, supports it is that the same reason Navarro supports it. They, they believe in the Constitution of 1824. They believe in federalism because they want to develop Texas. And a lot of that's about supporting Anglo immigration. Because Seguin, Juan Seguin here, he's, he starts making his living by trading with the Americans, by trading in Northern Mexico, by getting goods from New Orleans, like I talked about earlier. So he's right in the mix of all these different pieces. He has everything at stake in the continued development of this that Navarro does, right? So when Santa Ana uh, overthrows the Constitution of 1824, and there is now a civil war across Mexico, you know, Seguin doesn't have to think about this. He knows he's going to be on the Federalist side of the civil war and he's not fighting for independence at the beginning he's not interested in that he is interested in restoring the constitution of 1824 all right he's a, he's interested in opposing santa Ana and the overthrow of this constitution that his own father helped write right and Seguin throws himself into the fight you know he's in his mid-20s when the revolution breaks out navarro can't fight because navarro as I said, is, has an injury, but um, Seguin can. And so right after the, the battle in, of Gonzales on October 2nd, 1835, right? We talked about that a little on Monday. Um, Seguin immediately goes and organizes a Tejano regiment of 34 Tejanos who will be a part of whatever this is gonna be, Texas army, Texas resistance. All he knows is he wants to oppose Santa Ana and so he raises um, a, a cavalry unit, essentially, mounted horsemen uh, from the ranches of that are uh, the Tejanos owned south of San Antonio. San Antonio River, south of, of town, had a lot of ranches, and he would ride from ranch to ranch, recruiting, basically, saying, we've got to fight for um, our rights, we've got to restore the Constitution, we've got to be against Santa Ana, and he raised this, this unit. So he's in the fighting from the very, very beginning, right? He and his Tejanos are a part of throwing General Koss out of San Antonio. So on Monday, we talked a little bit about you know, the chaos of the revolution and the chaos that surrounded the storming of San Antonio in December 1835. Once again, he's right in the mix of that stuff. He and his Tejanos are a part of throwing out the Mexican army, the Santa Ana army, essentially, from December 5th to December 9th, 1835. They, they helped throw Koss uh, out. And then he's in San Antonio, you know, in December and January and February, 1836, right? So Seguin is in town with the kind of motley crew of Texas rebels that are milling around there in the early spring of 1836. Again, like we talked about on Monday, it's kind of chaotic. There's no good organization. It's not clear what kind of Texas army there is because there are volunteers and then there's regulars and they have different commanders. and. They're not quite sure if anyone's coming at any point uh, to contest them. So when Santa Ana shows up on February 23rd, 1836, on the outskirts of San Antonio, right? This is a good picture of Santa, of Santa Ana, by the way. I love using this because it's, uh, it's not as beautiful as some of his official portraits are, more realistic. It was also taken a little later in life. So to be fair to Santa Ana, um, it was a little younger at the time of the revolution itself, but you know, my students really enjoy getting to see an actual picture of Santa Ana as opposed to like a painting image. But when Santa Ana's troops marched into San Antonio, you know, Seguin and 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 many Tejanos um, move into the Alamo complex along with the Anglo defenders that go in there. All right, this is the key point that I think a lot of our students might have a vague sense of, but I really think it's worth stopping for a moment and emphasizing. It's something that I emphasize when I teach the Texas history class. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, is that inside the Alamo, you have Anglos, like William Barrett Travis here, and you have Tejanos, like Juan Seguin, all right? And they are united in being against Santa Ana, all right? That is the one thing they can agree on. Um, Travis here wants independence. Seguin here wants to restore the Constitution. Those are those divisions that we keep talking about. But they both hate Santa Ana and don't like it, all right? So that's worth emphasizing. It gets back to, again, the civil war within Mexico context. 
But the other thing I want to point out is that, you know, the Texas Revolution was not a white people versus Mexican people, Americans versus Mexicans kind of affair, as some people tend, for some reason, to think it, it was. Um, that will happen. That will be the U.S.-Mexico War, but that won't happen until 1846 to 48. In 1836, this is the Texans, Anglos and Tejanos, against Santa Ana and his centralist regime, right? That's the central fight. And I love using this image of the Alamo. So when Santa Ana's army moved into um, San Antonio and they marched into town, um, they, they, this is what the Alamo looked like to them from the outside. This was a sketch that was done by one of Santa Ana's lieutenants. And I point it out because I wanna point something out to you guys. Do you see the flag that's flying over the Alamo right here? You probably can't see it very well, but it's a, it's a tricolored flag, three colors there, the Mexican colors. And it's got two stars. Those two stars are for Coahuila and Texas. So this flag is a Federalist Constitution of 1824 flag. It's in favor of restoring, restoring the states and restoring Coahuila, Texas. So it's an anti-Santa Ana thing to say, to have that flag flying. It's not for independence. It's for restoring the Constitution of 1824. We know that flag was flying at the beginning of the Alamo siege and Texas had not even declared independence. Um, February 23rd, 1836, right? Anyway, so Juan Seguin and the fellow Tejanos are in the Alamo during the bombardments that go on throughout the 13-day siege. Juan Seguin himself endured that for about, you know, five days um, within the Alamo complex. But he's going to be a part of trying to get the word out to the rest of Texas about what's going on there. So the men who went into the Alamo and I know you guys know this, but I always have to remind my students, like nobody wanted to die there, right? That was not the plan. Like, let's go be martyrs. No one did that. They wanted to be reinforced. And so this is the famous victory or death letter that William Barrett Travis wrote from, from inside the Alamo um, on February 24th. He wrote a lot of letters like this throughout the scene, asking for help, asking for um, reinforcements. And, and we know this, this is something that our students I think are generally aware of. But I think it's worth emphasizing that he handed most of those letters to Tejanos to ride out. The Tejanos tended to be the couriers out of the Alamo. Not all of them, not exclusively, but Juan Seguin himself will become a courier out of the Alamo, in part because it was easier to sneak through the lines for the Tejanos to get past Santa Ana's troops. Um, and they knew the land out around San Antonio and the geography far better than anyone else because that was their home, home turf. So. Travis hands Seguin a letter on February 28th, which is one day before the 32 men from Gonzales will arrive as reinforcements. And so Seguin rides out of the Alamo. That's why he doesn't, he doesn't die there. He heads down toward Goliad, all right, which is where, of course, Fannin's men are, the 400 down there that the Alamo is desperately hoping will show up. Um, he doesn't get all the way to Goliad. He actually runs into one of um, Fannin's lieutenants and hands the hands the, the note to uh, Fannin's man and says, go tell Fannin he needs to come up to the Alamo and, and reinforce him there. And then from there, Seguin goes up to Gonzales, all right? And so to rally troops and to, to get men together. When he gets to Gonzales, um, he's there when Sam Houston arrives and he's there just a couple days later when news of the Alamo's fall happens. And so in Gonzales, Seguin decides to organize another Tejano regiment. And so he starts pulling together Tejanos who have arrived in Gonzales, who have left San Antonio because of Santa Ana's troops that are there and trying to get away. One of the people he pulls into service is this guy, Antonio Menchaca, who Menchaca is a fascinating character and his memoirs have just been translated and published. It's a really amazing um, resource. I highly recommend it. Um, but Menchaca was just trying to get away from the violence. He wasn't volunteering to serve in the army, but he got pressed into service, kind of whether he liked it or not. And he gets put into Juan Seguin's unit and becomes uh, third in command in Juan Seguin's unit. And so what happens next is the runaway scrape, right? People start retreating east. Sam Houston's army retreats east. You guys know this story because I know you teach this in your classrooms, but you know, once the fall of the Alamo happens, Sam Houston tells, tells Fannin, you know, fall back. And then he, Sam Houston falls back. 
And as he does it, you know, there are people scrambling, trying to get away to safety from Santa's army. That's that runaway scrape where everyone's trying to escape. We're going to talk a lot about that tomorrow when we talk about women in the Texas Revolution because they were caught in the thick of the runaway scrape more than anybody else. But while that's happening and Houston's army is retreating, Houston puts Juan Seguin and Antonio Menchaca and the Tejanos in charge of protecting the rear of the Texas army from any approach of, of uh, Santa and his forces. And so um, they guard the back end. They also help um, people trying to escape in the runaway scrape. They're basically managing the chaos at the back end of the retreating Texas army as it's making its way further and further east, all right? This was especially important for the Tejanos to do at the rivers, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, but the rivers were the biggest source of chaos during the runaway scrape. This is where people got built up and couldn't get across rivers for very long, because there's no bridges in this time period, right? You only have, this is an image of a Texas uh, river from this period. Um, you have these um, rafts that people had to go across while someone's pulling it across on a, on a rope sort of thing. And so the Tejanos played a very important role in keeping order on the back end of the retreating army and all the refugees that are trying to escape and, and trying to keep that chaos to a minimum and helping especially the women and children who are at the center of the runaway scrape trying to get away. Um, it was an enormous task that they, they took on. And they stayed with the Texas army throughout the, the retreat east to Gross's plantation and as they were moving further and further toward Louisiana. While this is happening, Santa Ana, as you can see up here on the left, is getting impatient. And Santa Ana wants to basically capture the Texas government and defeat the Texas army as fast as he possibly can. So Santa Ana moved with a much smaller force of about 900 trying to pursue Sam Houston. As he gets close enough to Sam Houston, Sam Houston learns that Santa Ana is nearby and that he only has about the same number of troops that Sam Houston did. So that's probably your best odds you're ever going to get, is what Sam Houston decides. And so Sam Houston turns his army, including the Tejanos, toward Santa Ana's army. And they march, you know, 55 miles in two days to get to um, the place that we know as San Jacinto. All right. When they get there, and then Sam, Santa Ana's army arrives, and both sides are getting ready for the fight, um, Sam Houston's preparing for battle, and he decides that he is not going to include the Tejanos in the battle that's about to come. And the main reason for this is he didn't want the Tejanos to get killed because if his army marches in and fights Santa Ana's army, pretty soon it's not gonna be, people are gonna be making careful distinctions on are these Tejanos or are these members of Santa Ana's army that I'm shooting at? He's afraid a lot of them might get killed. So Sam Houston orders Juan Seguin and his 19 Tejanos, he had 19 Tejanos at San Jacinto, he orders Seguin to guard the baggage and guard the horses while the rest of the army goes into the actual fight itself. Right? And you can imagine if you're Juan Seguin or Antonio Manchaca, right? And you've experienced all of this, you hate Santa Ana as much as anybody else. You don't like, you, you've been marching with this army this whole way. You've been managing the chaos. You've gotten all this point. And now Sam Houston says, you're gonna sit with the bags and make sure everything's okay back there, right? That, that didn't sit terribly well with the Tejanos. So both, um, both uh, Seguin here and Menchaca march over to Sam Houston's tent to confront him. And we know what they said because Antonio Menchaca wrote it down later in his memoirs. And so this is Menchaca's uh, account of what Menchaca told Sam Houston when he goes up to him and basically says, I don't think so, right? This is Menchaca speaking. He says, when I joined the Americans, I'd done so with a view of aiding them in their fight and that I wanted to do so even if I died facing the army. I did not enlist to guard horses and I would do no such duty. If that was the alternative, I would go and attend to my family, which is on its way to Nacogdoches without escort or servants. And Houston then told me he would gladly let me and my company go to fight. And the point I wanna make with this is that the Tejanos demanded and then got, uh, got, that, got the approval for doing so to be a part of the fight at San Jacinto. That this was as much their fight as it was Sam Houston or anybody else in his army. And so when Houston and his men charged across the battlefield on April 21st, 1836, at about 3.30 in the afternoon, Seguin is over here on the left as a part of the cavalry that's attacking over here on this side. There's about 19 Tejanos under Seguin's leadership that enter into the fight. 
And it's a it's a bloody melee, right? You guys know about the Battle of San Jacinto. Eight minutes, 18 minutes in, the battle itself is over. Which I always say, like, who's got a stopwatch like for that, right? Who's like, okay, everybody start the battle, click, 18 minutes later. Oh, we're done. Good job. I don't know how we get 18 minutes, but um the fight goes on, you know, much long after that as the Mexican army disperses and um and they basically take no prisoners until dark. The Guillen is part of all of that. And his own memoirs, which you can also get access to, have been published and translated, are really amazing. This is Seguin's account of the uh, Battle of San Jacinto itself, which says, my company was in the left wing. We marched out and he sort of talks about capturing. Um, he captures a lot of San, um, Santa Ana's army who seem more willing to surrender to a Tejano than they are to any of the Anglos out on the field, right? So my point is Seguin is a hero, both of the Alamo and of San Jacinto. He's at both of those places, and he's lived the full revolution from, you know, right after the Battle of Gonzales up until the, the moment when Santa Ana himself is being captured at San Jacinto. He sees all of that, participates in every bit of it from the word go, along with the rest of the Tejanos who are in his company, right? And then after the fight, they, the Tejanos, share in all of the destruction that had happened during the revolution and the aftermath, right? The runaways scrape when all these people are running away from Santa Ana's army. The Tejano families did the same thing. Menchaca mentioned, you know, his family got in active coaches. So had Juan Seguin's family trying to escape. And so Seguin goes and, and gets them in Nacogdoches and then tries to bring them back towards San Antonio. Seguin himself had been given orders to accept the surrender of the rest of the Mexican army in Texas in San Antonio. And so Seguin is, he goes to San Antonio and on June 4th, 1836, it is Juan Seguin who accepts the surrender of the rest of the Mexican army. That's what really ends the Texas Revolution, right? Um, the treaties of Velasco matter, Santa Ana's capture matters, but the rest of the army, Mexican army had to surrender and then retreat. And it is Juan Seguin who accepts that surrender in San Antonio, right? And is the official end really of hostilities within Texas. And once again, and his fellow Tejanos, when they get back to the areas around San Antonio, they find enormous amount of destruction waiting for them. And so here is Seguin talking about how everything had been ruined, right? There was not one of them, he means the Tejanos, who did not lament the loss of a relative killed to the crown their, mis to crown their misfortunes. They found their houses in ruins, their fields laid waste, their cattle destroyed and dispersed. I myself found my ranch despoiled. A little was spared by the retreating enemy had been wasted by our own army. Basically, both armies had, had taken what cattle they needed to feed themselves. And Santa Ana's army in particular had basically ravaged the area, supporting itself while it was in Texas. And the Tejanos experienced all of those things. And then it is Juan Seguin, and this is something else I think it's worth emphasizing to our students, who buries the ashes of the Alamo defenders. After the Battle of the Alamo, all the bodies of the defenders have been burned in giant funeral pyres. Well, their ashes just stayed out in the open, along with charred bones and whatever was left over. It is Juan Seguin in early 1837 who gathers all of that up and gives it a proper burial and remembers the, the great sacrifice that the defenders of the Alamo had made. So with that, I will stop and I'll hand it back over to Jay real fast. And I'll give you some resources real quick. And then I think we're gonna put you guys into some breakout rooms so we can have some conversations. All right, thank you. So if you have not um, read Juan Seguin's biography, uh, which is posted at the inside of um, the very first one, Revolution Remembered Memoirs Selected Correspondent, it's a really good read. Um, it, it offers a great deal more perspective of what um, going on with this man because I even reading and researching this I discovered so much um, I saw in the chat somebody says I just love once again I'm a fan too now I'll be honest with you on that one so um, what I did on this one is kind of traces political and military um, history um, I wanted to start this out a little bit with the um, Mexican independence um, struggles. He was part, he was a youth at that time, as Andrews talks about, and 
Um, that was one of the things I, I was not aware of how young he was. And that's one thing I'm actually going to weave into my Texas history class so my kids can relate to that a little bit. Um, his biography kind of talks about him, not a lot, but you could truly use that as a, um, a, a good little segue um, to, to get some connection pieces between the kids and um, the history that we have in front of us. So it kind of talks about where he starts out as a youth. He starts first, obviously, follows his father's um, footsteps in the politics. And then eventually we see him stepping into a much more military role, um, not only in San Antonio history, but as well as um, in Texas history. And the, his biography really does a good job of just kind of going step by step of what he does. Um, you know, where he's elected as the mayor, where he's elected as some other form of political office. Um, and um, he, he was a, to me, my perspective of him, he was a, he was a player. I mean, he knew how to make things happen uh, for Texas history um, and for San Antonio as well too. Um, document A is when Santa Ana decides to switch camps. He ultimately goes from um, being a Federalist to a um, Centralist. And Seguin in this um, letter is basically trying to get everybody to support um, this idea we need to push back on Santa Ana. And this is where I discovered that the Anglo settlers, especially around Nacogdoches, kind of had that decision. I don't think we want to do that quite yet. Um, and the reason why is they haven't finalized all of the land or the uh, titles to their land. So their attitude is, listen, uh, we don't really, we really understand what you're saying, but we don't want to really push too hard because we may never get our titles. Um, so we have a letter that he um, discusses where he's dissatisfied with um, Santa Ana, um, talks about um, that he joins forces. I didn't realize this. Um, again, this is kind of that Texas history, what we don't know about. But around this time frame in, in 1835, um, Cuela y Tejas, there was this battle on political parties and where the capital was supposed to be. And it moves from Saltillo to Mon uh, Moncrada. And we see this battle to where one side, which would be more of the Federalist side, where Seguin is, he actually rounds up troops like we've learned already and heads to restore the capital um, out of Moncrada into Saltillo. But yet he's, we see the um, overall disgust as he says it himself, the weakness with the governor, pledge ourselves to influence or stir Texas against the tyrannical government of Santa Ana. Um, this to me is a good indicator of kind of where the young Tejanos are kind of gravitating towards. Um, but I also found it really interesting that uh, there was not a lot of Anglo support for this effort. Uh, document B. Um, I get a little background information of where what Tejanos are supposed to be doing during the, um, the Texas Revolution. And there is a quote um, uh, from a revolution remembered, um, typically foraying, spying, horsemanship. Um, and this would, I use this uh, quote uh, in my classroom because I really try to promote that the Tejanos were really gifted horsemen. Um, especially they learned from the, the native, uh, the Comanches and the Apaches on how to fight on horseback. So these guys kind of adapted over the years to fight. So this kind of puts them in a, a positive light. Um, and then I also talk about when Seguin leaves. Um, and then ultimately we have, um, you know, a, a, a little bit of conversation about his recollections of the bombardment and what he was going to do. And by being sent out, I mean, I, I show the movie, The Alamo, the newer version, not the John Wayne version. Um, and we see Seguin leaving and my kids always ask what happens and then they see him later. Um, that I don't think the kids really get a full understanding of what he was doing. So this, this piece right here, this quote here can help provide some closure to that question I seem to get in my classroom. And then we'd have that conversation about the runaway scrape um, after and you can, there in his memoirs, you can go further with this because there was that conversation that he has. He sees one of his men says, yeah, Fannin's on his way. And then he then sees another man, which, which he gives the notice to that first guy. And then there's a second guy from Fannin's group said, no, no, he went back. You can add that into it. I thought about doing that, but I didn't want to bog this down any more than, or, or lengthen it any more than it needed to be where you can have additional conversations. Well, wh why do you think, uh, what would, what would, 
would you do if you were Seguin and find out that um, they're not coming? What, what's the next step for you um, if you were in his position? So there's a lot of different ways you can play, take these primary source documents and um, get student conversation with it. And then the last one talks about when he gets to, to Seguin, um, he reorganizes his band together of his companions. Many of them left the Alamo. Um, there is a quotation in his book that they thought it was kind of crazy that they were going to stay at the Alamo um, and they were going to go move further in, into Texas itself. And then we see that they, he talks about his role um, of what he was doing during the runaway scrape um, as, as the Tejano groups were traveling through the San Antonio River Valley, um, trying to get people to leave um, all the way through uh, San Felipe. And his memoirs give a really good account of the runaway scrape um, that I feel like Texas history has forgotten in our classroom. Um, and then the last one, this is, a, this is probably a long, this is the battle itself, Battle of San Jacinto. Again, I get background information again. Again, it's just trying to keep connection pieces. And there are some primary source documents as well in here, a little bit more about it. And it tells what his role was. And then talking about he actually, as Dr. Torger talked about, um, who he ultimately sees first. Um, you have Almonte Diaz, some of the officers as well. Um, and I just feel like this little showing the history of this man as in Texas history is a good insight to giving him voice into our history, our curriculum. Um, I feel that the only time up until really starting to work with Dr. Torget, all I ever saw is Juan Seguin was just briefly, we teach the teak who he was and then we move on. Um, I'm hopeful that you guys take this information and you're able to give Juan Seguin um, greater uh, voice in the classroom. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Torget and I think we're in the